Greetings. I am delighted to see such a big turnout for what I hope is going to be a fabulous and interesting talk. Um, today we have two speakers, not just one, they're going to tag team this. So um, Catherine McEwen is currently the founding director of Columbia's Data Science Institute. She is the Henry and Gertrude Rothschild Professor of Computer Science. And her research area is in natural language processing and social media. And she, it turns out, has pretty much run Columbia in various ways, shapes, and forms for many years, including being a department chair, as well as the vice dean for research in the School of Engineering and Applied Sciences. Um, and I always like to make the jolly good fellow joke, but usually it's because people that are a fellow of one is society. But I think I have at least three of which Catherine is a fellow, which includes the AAAI, the Association for Computational Linguistics, and the ACM. Um, and I'm sure there'll be more to come. And then joining her is Desmond Patton, who is currently a Berkman Fellow, and that's how I actually met Desmond. And I heard about the work that he was doing in, at Columbia in the SAFE Lab about um, looking at how youth and young adults in urban and um, violent written neighborhoods sort of express things about that and how they cope with the environments they live in using things like social media and text processing. And I thought that that was a fabulous topic for us to hear about. And so I've been super excited since then, um, and I'm glad this has finally worked out. He is, in addition to being a Berkman Fellow, also an assistant professor at Columbia in both he's in the School of Social Work, and he's affiliated with um, the Data Science Institute as well as the Social Intervention Group. So on that note, I'm going to shut up and leave it to our fabulous speakers. So please take it away. Welcome, our speakers. All right. Can everyone hear me? Great. Uh, good afternoon, and thank you so much for having us today. Um, by way of introduction, I just want to give you a bit more about who I am and how I got to this work. Um, I define myself as a digital qualitative researcher, which means I'm interested in how the narratives of individuals and communities show up in digital spaces like social media, and how we can leverage those stories to better understand social inequality and population health. And as a social worker, I'm interested in social media as a tool for intervention and prevention in the transmission of community-based violence and, op and the opportunity it presents itself for prevention. So when I joined the faculty at Columbia three years ago, I immediately contacted Kathy McEwen because I wanted more efficient methods to analyzing social media data, but I wanted to make sure that the approach maintained the integrity of the social media content, that is, to the best of our ability, interpret and translate social media content as it was intended with the context and nuance. And this has turned into a true interdisciplinary data science collaboration, where our understanding of the meaning and context of social media posts directly informs computational development, and the constraints of computational development shape our qualitative process. And so today, Kathy and I are going to present our efforts together to leverage context and nuance in Twitter communication to develop computational tools to study and potentially intervene in gang violence in high-risk neighborhoods in Chicago. So this work is really motivated by two issues that are really important to me. Number one, Chicago is consistently in the news as everyone wants to understand how and why Chicago has seen a dramatic uptick in violence with over 4,000 shooting victims and a 58% increase in homicides in 2016 and in 2017. And in addition, social media has transformed how we interact with one another and democratized how we access and share information. On the one hand, it serves as the means through which individuals from marginalized communities can engage in knowledge sharing and the creation of affirming narratives that run counter to the often pathologizing mainstream discourses. And on the other hand, social media can also exist within, ex can also exist within existing ecologies of conflict and could operate as an avenue that facilitates offline violence. So while existing research on violence has provided important things, insights into the etiology and social life of violence, few studies have examined the role of social media in these processes. 
Yet social media is an increasingly important means through which to contextualize digital communication and engage communities and law enforcement and policymakers in solution-oriented discussions that can reconceptualize how we do violence prevention. So what role does social media play in our violence prevention efforts? And so and our idea is to treat social media as a community, as an environmental context, a unique and complex environment composed of culture, behaviors, and language, and symbols that need to be translated and interpreted within their original context. And so we have decided to start with a case study approach. In 2014, when I was at the University of Michigan on faculty there, I came across a news article with a headline that said, the gun-toting gang girl of Chicago was killed. And so, like many of you, I was really dismayed by the sensational title, but I dug deeper into her story and I learned more about this young woman that you see before you, who is Ja'Kyra Barnes. Ja'Kyra Barnes, 17 years old at the time she was killed by a rival gang, but there was much more to her story. By the time she was one, her father had been shot and killed in front of her doorstep. By the time she was 13, she had seen more murder and death than probably everyone in this room. At 13, she joined one of the neighborhood faction gangs to be committed and connected to her community. She was also quite prolific on Twitter. She had around 5,000 tweets and 27, uh, 27,000 followers, I'm sorry, 5,000 followers and 27,000 tweets, which placed her engagement on Twitter around the 90th percentile. And allegedly, by the time she was 17 years old, she had shot or killed up to 20 people. But there was much more to her story. So oftentimes, we focus on the salacious details of this person, but when we, when we dug deeper into her life, we realized that this young woman had trauma and pain and grief that affected her in ways that are probably hard to understand both clinically and at a societal level. And so we've used her Twitter data as a place to understand her and individuals in her community and to consider the ways in which we can apply this to larger interventions that, we're t that we will discuss later on. But uh, those translations of Jakira's Twitter comments are really complicated. It's a gumbo of letters and shortened words and catchphrases and colloquialisms and emojis and intricate punctuation which envelops a linguistically complex 140 characters that are often hyper-local and intended specifically for that user's audience. So as you might imagine, Lacking that context could easily lead to gross misinterpretations that can make a seemingly innocuous post threatening. And this tends to happen when the user is from a marginalized group. So how do we then take an approach to social media that centers context and nuance and culture, but also allows you to confront the biases with which you bring to interpreting social media in the first place? And so in an effort to do this, we wanted to develop an approach that first, centers culture and context, and two, actively confronts the bias we bring to social media interpretation. And so I, along with members from my Safe Lab, created the Contextual Approach to Social Media Analysis, or CASMA. CASMA is a multi-stage qualitative research methodology approach that is adapted from textual and discourse analysis. It is a qualitative methodology situated in the construction of theory through data analysis. And unlike textual and discourse analysis, CASMA is designed to leverage multiple points of expertise from community experts, social work researchers, to identify and describe offline environmental and situational conditions like exposure to community violence, trauma, and grief, as well as what I call internet banging, which is a term that I coined in an article in 2013 to describe the processes on social media that resemble gang-like behavior offline. So I'm going to walk you through our CASMA approach. I'm going to give you a few examples of how we do this. So first, before we do any kind of contextual digging, we ask our annotators, who are Master of Social Work students at Columbia, to just 
write down their initial impressions of what's happening in the tweet so that we can get a baseline of what they think about the tweet before they dig deeper. And this is all housed in the annotation system that we created at, um, at Columbia. And so here they are asked to view a tweet and to provide their impressions of that tweet. And then our annotators, after they've provided their initial impressions, they're asked to go through a seven procedure um, task to elicit context within a Twitter post. And so the first set of procedures were developed to get a deeper level understanding of the individual user. So we asked our annotators to go back to the original link to the tweet and look at the text, look at the emojis, the hashtags, look at any links that might be embedded in the tweet, look at the images and look at the videos and note take or take field notes on everything that you think is occurring in these particular um, posts. And then also think about the biographical information that the user provides on their Twitter page as well. What can you gleam about location, neighborhood, school, friendships, birthdays, that kind of thing. The second set of procedures focus on how the author of the post interacts with their network. So we look at who's been mentioned or tagged in the post. Any offline events or situations that have been referenced in the post. We look at how many things, how many times a post has been liked or retweeted, and replies and comments between users as well. And then we ask the user to go back to that same box and provide another assessment of what's happening in the tweet based on this contextual review. So here's an example of a mention or a tag in a post that we oftentimes annotate. Here, Taekwon Assassin, who was Ja'Kyra Barn, someone is talking to her and says, why the fuck you leave us? Why, man, I swear this ain't happening. I'm fitting to turn up on shit over. So in this particular post, the author is tagging Ja'Kyra because she has been killed by a rival gang member. And two things are happening. Number one, the author indicates that they're in disbelief, a part of the grieving process around Ja'Kyra's death, but also because of this grief and because of their own assessment of how this grief came about, they now want to do something about that grief, potentially retaliatory in nature. We also indicate things around likes and retweets. If you ain't in the streets or know what's going on, don't speak about what's going on. And as you can see this particular post, which is describing a user who is kind of fed up of chatter that seems to, to not be integral, to not, be, to not uh, be connected to truth. And this particular tweet was retweeted over 420 times and liked 242 times as well. And then we also look very carefully at replies and comments through conversations that unfold on Twitter. In this particular post, it says, I'm fitting to roll up a user's name right now. And the conversations that unfold from this then indicate what will happen later. So one person says, and some motherfuckers be smoking you next week. Don't see your, don't, don't even do, I uh, can't figure it, see this. And don't do that stuff to yourself, dude. And so essentially in this particular post, someone has commented and said, well, they're gonna engage in some aggressive behavior. But then someone else comments on that and says, well, I will do something about that if I see you in the streets. And again, we, we ask our um, annotators to provide a description after they have been um, looked at all of the contextual clues and they put, it in, they put the information in the general description box. We also analyze threat level by considering the entire context of the post along a scale from zero to one intervals of 0.1. And so we require our annotators to explain the reasoning behind the threat level in detail, allowing us to compare and contrast how they each may see this post differently based on their perceptions, biases, and experiences. And here are some of the things that our annotators are asked to consider when they are considering how to annotate a post as threatening or not. 
our annotators then label each social media post. So before a label is applied to any data, they have gone through multiple iterative steps of looking for context and nuance in the data. And then we then label the data. And so when we hand off our data set to Kathy's group, we've asked them to label the data in three important ways. Number one, and there are three things that have emerged from the data in which become the labels. One is loss or grief. Two is aggression, and then other, which includes things like social behavior, mood, neighborhood, status seeking health, growth, and things like that. And so when we hand off our labels to Kathy's group, she is then looking for three codes, loss, aggression, and other. So uh, just to start, I thought I would say a bit more about our interaction. As you can see, the kind of annotation that um, Desmond's group is doing is um, very rich. And when we started off this work about two years ago, uh, we knew we couldn't use all of it yet because it was such a hard task. And so this is why we started with um, essentially wanting to get the binary labels, aggression and loss, and then uh, collapsed um, the other groups into other. Um, we have a lot of back and forth between us in our meetings. So um, for, for example, we have times when we're looking at what we can do with our system, and this informs um, Desmond's group in terms of what they all do in, in terms of annotation. Um, for us, uh, given that the language is so different, we often uh, don't understand what's being said in the tweet. So um, a lot of our time back and forth has been in interpreting um, what, what the meaning is in the Twitter that we see. Uh, for example, um, in one of our group meetings, uh, Desmond had um, youth from Chicago who had been um, involved uh, speak to us. So we were on um, uh, Skype together with them. And what we came out of that was interpretations written in uh, closer to standard American English for, for each of the tweets so that we could have an understanding of um, what was meant. And we looked at whether we could use that data um, in our processes. Um, so when we started, we knew it was a hard problem. And um, so we started with a more traditional uh, supervised learning approach using um, natural language to extract features, discrete features um, from the text. Um, and we used uh, the label data that we had at that point um, for the three labels, aggression, loss, and other. And uh, given that the language is so different from what uh, we normally ha see for our natural language systems, part of the effort went into being able to handle that. Um, it, we published that work in December of 2016. And over the last year, <clears throat> we've moved to looking first to see if we could get better results uh, with a neural net approach. Um, we still have a small amount of labeled data, but we have a very large amount of unlabeled data, um, over one million tweets. So we thought we could look and see whether we could use the semi-supervised approach to take advantage of the unlabeled data. So in this, we don't uh, use the traditional features that we might extract from the text. Rather, we use uh, various kinds of embedding. And for training, we're using both the unlabeled and the labeled data. And then finally, uh, we looked at an ensemble of the different methods. So I'm going to tell you about um, each of these and our results at this point in time. Um, so in the supervised approach, uh, we developed um, 
two kinds of systems. One was natural language tools that could handle the language that we were seeing. Um, and the second was a classifier uh, using a support vector machine. Um, so the initial data that we had, this was shortly after uh, Desmond joined Columbia, was small. Um, and what we had were uh, tweets from Jakira Barnes and her top 10 communicators. We had a total of just over um, 800 labeled data. For training, we had um, 600 tweets, and we reserved 100, roughly 100 for development and 100 for test. Um, and in addition to having this data labeled by uh, Desmond's group for aggression, loss, and other, we also manually annotated with it with part of speech tags uh, so that we could develop a part of speech tagger. Um, so if we look at um, this post, which is shown here, this is one uh, which is aggression, so, um, and further fi uh, fine-grain category of threat, um, the part of speech tagger would help us to be able to recognize that a word like op is a noun or smoke is a verb. Um, the part of speech tagger that we developed uh, was also done um, using the support vector machine, so a supervised method, and it used um, traditional uh, information that you would find in a part of speech tagger, like the words that occurred before, the part of speech tags that occurred before the word that we're trying to tag, um, as well as things like uh, brown clusters, which help to capture some of the semantics of the word. Um, in order to use lexical resources that are typically available within the natural language community, um, we needed to be able to understand the meaning of the individual words. So uh, we generated a phrase book, um, and we did this by uh, glossing each tweet with standard American English in our, t in our test set, and we did that in part using the interpretations that we had gotten from the youths, um, and we aligned them uh, using Giza++, a tool that's often used in machine translation, and this allowed us to generate a phrase book um, where, for example, in this one here, we could um, indicate that smoke means kill. And we, we did this for um, all of the vocabulary in our initial training set. Um, so the classifier for predicting aggression, loss, and other. Yes, Sasha? Hi. Hi. Can I ask if you tagged the emoji? We did use the emojis. Uh, we didn't tag them with part of speech, but yeah, you'll see a little bit about how we use them. You can ask more. <laughs> What yes. Is glossing? Oh, glossing is we essentially wrote a translation for each of the tweets. So, and then when we say we align them, we align the words in the tweet with the gloss. Um, so the features that uh, we used for the classifier um, included uh, the words. Um, Unigram, so these are individual words like spot in uh, the previous tweet. Um, we also use bigrams, so these are words that um, typically occur together as a unit and carry meaning as a unit, so stony spot would be one example of a bigram, which indicates a location. Um, so we thought, uh, I actually I had an undergraduate working on this. She's now a graduate student at University of Washington. Um, and uh, she thought that emotion should really play a role because, again, we're talking about, um, you know, really opposites in terms of what the meaning is intended, aggression or, or loss. And so uh, we use scores which indicate um, the emotion of the individual words in the tweet. Um, and then we also made use of the emojis which um, behave as regular words as far as the classifier goes. 
Um, so for, for the emotion scores, we use the dictionary called the Dictionary of Affect in Language. And um, each, this is a dictionary which has words in the English language, and each word has associated with it a score along a scale for how pleasant the word is. So um, high would be very pleasant, low would be very unpleasant. Um, activation, which indicates the intensity, so you could imagine um, a word like love has more intensity than a word like hot, uh, like, um, or a word like furious has more intensity than a word like angry. Um, and then the third score is for imagery. Um, the higher the score, the more likely it is that you could visualize uh, what the word is referring to. So for example, chair would have a high imagery score, um, while a word like love would have a low image, it's more abstract, so it would have a low imagery score. Of course, um, so the, the DAL is um, not large in comparison to other uh, dictionaries that we have, so for words that are missing, um, we use WordNet, which is to find synonyms for words which we have in our Twitter which don't appear in the DAL. Um, however, in the tweets that we have, um, many of these would not occur in either WordNet or in the Dictionary of Affect and Language. Um, and we need to be able to map from the slang or acronyms that are being used to words that occur in the DAL. Um, and here's where we used our phrase book uh, that we developed. We also experimented with Wiktionary, which is a dictionary which contains a lot of acronyms and words that are typically used on social media. However, we found that um, our phrase book was, had um, quite a bit more accurate translations, 83% um, over Wiktionary, which was closer to only 48%. So we stuck with our phrase book for um, accessing words in the DAL. Uh, for emojis, um, we made use of abbreviated Unicode definitions. Um, and so uh, for an emoji to look it up in the, DA, the DAL, we would make use of, the, we would look up the words that are um, provided as the definition. And you can see that um, this is, uh, it's, it's, it could be improved upon. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> um, <laughs> when we have the, pr the praying hands, this is the um, emoji that's most often used with loss. And so um, clearly we could have better than just a description of, of what we see. But this is what we use for the first time around. Um, and this would also let us look up scores for um, emojis in the DAL. Um, so each one of these axes has a score uh, from one to three, and we experimented with different methods for how to combine them. And we found that the best method was to use um, the minimum and maximum for each dimension over all words in the tweet. So you can see this would give us, um, yeah, uh, three scores basically. So we experimented also with different ways of using the um, support vector machine. Um, we first tried three-way classification, and this gave us uh, relatively low scores. Um, we had experimented separately with a binary classifier on just a subset labeled for aggression and loss, and it did quite a bit better, although it was not realistic. So we ended up with a, a cascaded classifier where first we separated out all tweets that were labeled with aggression and loss from all others, um, and then we used a, our binary classifier on the aggression loss subset. Um, we use F measure as a score. Um, this is a balanced com combination of precision, which tells us how often um, our classifier is correct. 
um, and recall, which tells us of all, for example, let's say aggression for all of the tweets that are labeled with aggression, how many w was our classifier able to recall. And you'll see that we're much higher on recall than on precision. And for the end application, this is actually good because um, what we want to do is make use of this tool with community outreach groups. Desmond will say a bit about that at the end. And um, they can do more of the filtering. It's better that they catch everything and they can do um, more of the filtering uh, with our precision. OK, so um, we were limited with label data, but we thought, well, we ought to be able to take advantage of the very large corpus of unlabeled tweets that we had. Um, we started off with over uh, one million tweets. Um, as you'll see, we couldn't make use of all of them, although we are continuing to look at ways to increase that. Um, we experimented with different ways of doing distance supervision. I'm only going to talk about the one that worked. Um, we're still working on, the, on other methods. And actually, I would be happy to uh, hear from people who have tried using semi-supervised approaches with, with neural nets. Um, so in our approach, we used uh, distance supervision using the emojis. Um, and I'll say a little bit more of how we did that. Um, this created distance supervision uh, was used to then to label um, a large number of the uh, unlabeled tweets. And um, at the same time that we did this, we also turned to making use of um, neural nets. And so we used uh, what we learned with the distance supervision to initialize the weights of the um, neural nets. We experimented, so we did this work over a year now. We experimented with many uh, different um, forms of neural nets. Um, and we ended up with uh, CNNs as the best performing. Um, and we looked at them both at the word level and the character level. So the idea is the distance supervision is used to initialize the weights, and then they're trained on the label data, of which we have less. Um, so um, we used a standard convolutional neural net. Um, and we hypothesized that it would be good to work both at the word and at the character level, because a lot of the um, words are, are non-standard words. They can be acronyms or misspellings. And uh, we also have um, very long hashtags, which carry information as well. And um, the neural nets, the character level, should be able to get at them. One example that was uh, very common is a hashtag which has free in it, and then usually other names as, as part of it all concatenated together, and that's a very strong sig signal of loss. Um, the words or the characters were represented um, using dense embedding vectors. Um, the word vectors were initialized in the standard CNN with uh, pre-trained word to vec vectors, and the character vectors um, were randomly initialized. Um, but then we tuned the embedding vectors uh, during the training of the neural net, so they weren't kept static. Um, before processing, um, we pre-processed the tweets to remove URLs, um, user mentions, retreat markers, um, and rare words, and we replaced them with uh, special tokens. But we kept hashtags intact. Um, and in this model, each emoji was treated as a single word or a character, depending on uh, whether we were using the word level CNN or the character level. So this shows the architecture of the CNN, where uh, we have the embedding of the tweet coming in. It's passed through convolution with a, a filter. And then um, this goes through a number of feature maps. And then we use max pooling over time. And finally, it's fed through a softmax classifier. 
Um, just to give you an idea, here are the hyperparameters and some of the implementation details that we use. So we experimented with different filter sizes ranging from one to five um, with 200 feature maps per filter. Um, we used a 256 dimensional tweet vector um, via 256 dimension dense layer. We regularize with 50% um, dropout. Um, and our character embeddings were 256 dimensions and the word embeddings were 300. Um, we implemented it in Keras with the TensorFlow backend and um, we use some of the features that come with Keras, a default parameter initialization um, and the nAtom optimizer with um, default parameters, for example, for the learning rate. Um, so for uh, distance supervision for um, both CNN models, we pre-trained um, on the, dis uh, the distantly labeled uh, related tasks, basically the same task on the unlabeled data. And we used these learned weights to initialize the CNN for when we trained it on the hand-labeled data. We also tried it with the um, SVM that we had, where we trained it on both the labeled and the distantly labeled data together. Um, so uh, we chose for our labels the emojis that the, had the highest correlation. Um, so for loss, uh, the most highly correlated emoji was um, the praying hands. Um, and in our unlabeled data, there were roughly 13,000 tweets um, that came with the um, praying hands. Uh, for aggression, um, the most highly correlated emoji was the gun emoji, and we were able to get 40, roughly 4,500 tweets uh, with that. Um, for other, we took um, all tweets that were not labeled with the top 10 emojis that uh, correlated with loss and with aggression, and then we sampled from that to get roughly the same size uh, proportion as in our um, label data. So we sampled uh, 33,000 for other, and this gave us an additional 50,000 uh, labeled tweets. Um, so we ran four experiments with the CNN um, at the word and the character level, both with pre-training using the distantly labeled uh, data and without. Um, and we ran the SVM on both the hand-labeled data and the hand-labeled plus the distantly labeled data. And then we uh, noticed that uh, when we were looking at results on our dev set that uh, the different classifiers got different things wrong. Um, and so we thought it would make sense to try an ensemble since they uh, failed um, in different areas. And so we learned the weights for the ensembles on a held out set of um, almost 1,200 tweets. Um, we, in, for these experiments, we had more data because Desmond's group had continued to work on this. So we have almost uh, 6,000 labeled tweets now. Um, you'll see that aggression is by far the largest quantity, sorry, other is by far the largest quantity. So this makes it hard to get um, aggression correct. For aggression, we had 387, for loss, 864, and for other, uh, 4,500. So that, that was uh, labeled by hand, and then it also included the 50,000 that were distantly labeled. So this slide shows our results. Um, the SVM, it's with a larger amount of labeled data, did not go up much beyond uh, what we were able to get uh, with a smaller data, data set. It went up about one point. Um, the SVM with the distant labels did not generalize, so you can see it drops uh, two points. And um, we think this is because uh, in our feature extraction, we had to rely on this uh, manual uh, labeling the 
to get the phrase book or to develop the part of speech tagging. And um, this doesn't generalize when we go to a larger data set. Um, in our, when we were working on the dev set, we did get an increase um, with the character CNN with pre-training and with the word CNN with pre-training over the SVM. But on our test set, uh, the results looked roughly the same, and this was very disappointing to us. Um, however, again, we had gotten quite good results when going to the ensemble um, on our development set, and we thought perhaps that would be the same here on the test set. And um, if we took a closer look at F measure, we can see that the model that does the best on loss is not the same model that does the best on other um, or aggression. Um, and furthermore, if we uh, look even closer, I'm not showing it here because it's a very large table, but when we looked even closer at the precision rec recall sl split, um, by these different groups, the, um, uh, it, was, it was quite different. So often, um, for example, for other, the SVM had um, high recall, whereas the character CNN had high precision. On aggression, the SVM had high precision, while the character CNN had high recall. Um, so, in fact, when we did do the ensemble, we got a boost of um, almost four points going up to close to 0.68. Um, these are a few examples which can give you some idea of, uh, in the ensemble, produced uh, the correct result. Um, so for the first tweet, should have was labeled with aggression. Um, the ensemble indicated an aggression. The character CNN and the word CNN got it correct, whereas the supervised one did not. And you can you can see again, you know, there are some of these uh, where um, we have abbreviations like MFS. We also have very different meanings uh, for some of the words that are in this tweet. Um, so, for example, here. Um, Bitch means gun. Um, and for loss, the, again, the character CNN does well because, again, we have um, misspellings and words which, abbreviations and words which may not appear um, in our lexicon. So in our current work, um, we're looking at how we can make use of the much richer context that Desmond's group provides. Uh, so we're looking at um, whether we can take into account the social network that um, the poster participates in. Uh, to do this, we're looking at previous tweets from the same user as well as previous tweets from other users. Um, and we're looking at how we can uh, build that social network. We're also looking at um, patterns in tweets. So Desmond's work shows that loss typically occurs before aggression. So for example, you would often have a post about loss, and then those posts may turn to posts about retribution and ultimately to um, aggression. So we're looking, if we can find that pattern in a sequence of posts by the same user, we're beginning to look at time series analysis um, to do that. Um, I'm also interested in, we're beginning to think about, but I think it's a hard problem. Um, typically, um, Desmond's group has found there is a trigger event. So you have a reference to some event which has occurred in the real world, um, which then triggers what, ha what happens. So can we pick up those uh, references to events? But this is uh, quite difficult, be again, because, because of the language. Okay, so Desmond's going to close off with our current work in engagement with communities. So community engagement is a really important aspect of the work that we're doing. We're not just interested in creating really cool and innovative computational tools, but can these tools actually work in society? 
One of the things we've learned from our deep contextual dive into Twitter is that a lot of young people are using Twitter in particular to express a host of emotions that include trauma and stress and pain, and they're just sitting there on social media. Um, they're oftentimes misunderstood, and we're doing nothing with them. And in particular, we're, we're also wondering, well, why are young people so willing to express such vulnerable aspects of their life? Why are they willing to speak in such aggressive and, and in times, uh, threatening ways? And what, what can we do with that information? And so we're really interested in building out educational, educational campaigns that change the norms with how young people use social media. Um, one of the things that I've done in my lab is to create a digital scholars lab where we bring in young people um, from uh, neighborhoods with high rates of community violence to do two things, to provide them with um, research skills and training so that they can become a part of creating tools um, and opportunities within their own neighborhood context, but to also help them think about what it means to be a digital citizen. What does it mean to have a, a positive digital footprint in their community? We're also hoping to begin to build out curriculums for training with law enforcement and educators and clinicians about how do you utilize social media in a way that is contextually centered and that leverages the voices of community members. We're also hoping to create uh, computational tools for clinicians for clinicians and violence outreach organizations. We have a partnership with two organizations in Chicago. We're working with a new organization called Community Sense to be able to create user interfaces for community-based organizations so that we can provide them with real-time social media data as a part of their prevention and intervention outreach work. And then we're working with a nonprofit called Child Serve. We're partnering with their homelessness um, program to train community members to be annotators and to leverage their own expertise to be a part of this type of research and to also give us feedback on how we are approaching our work and, and with the hopes of this being um, not only educational for the work that we're doing but also a, a tool for, for uh, future employment. So what would it look like for community members in Chicago to be the annotators for Facebook? Um, so those are some of the things that we're moving towards next. Thank you. Could you say a bit more about the nature of the computational tools that might be useful for clinicians and how it would be kind of uh, used in their, in their clinical work? Yeah, absolutely. So we're still trying to conceptualize what this looks like. We have had a conversation with a marketing organization that has expertise in created, creating user interfaces for uh, uh, marketing on uh, Facebook. What would it look like to have that tool for a uh, pediatrician at Lurie Children in Chicago that's worked with um, uh, young people that, are, that have been shot because of gang involvement. And so we don't know precisely what that looks like, but we know that there are lots of clues about the root causes of violence in terms of the offline <coughs> event that's happened, how they're processing the event, how that trauma operates in their life that's oftentimes not a part of a clinical interview or a part of um, how they're treated once they're in the facility. So how can we get that information to them to the pediatrician, to the social worker, quickly is what our is what our um, ultimate goal is. Thanks. Okay. Um, Desmond, you mentioned that you would like to uh, introduce some educational campaigns for for the youth to use digital resources differently. <coughs> Absolutely. What change would you like to see in how youth interact with digital world? Right. So you know what. I actually think that young people are using social media in really cool ways, right? I think that they have found a space to be themselves, to be vulnerable, um, but oftentimes when that vulnerability is in a context of violence and trauma, then things get really um, mixed up. And so, for, for, for example, are you aware of the consequences that might be associated with your digital footprint? If you say X, Y, Z on Twitter or on Facebook, do you realize and understand that there can be some trouble associated with that? Do you realize that other people might be viewing your post and how your post will be uh, misinterpreted? So just providing some kind of clear level of understanding, but also getting some feedback from them on how they want their post to be viewed as well. 
Well, I should say one of the things um, this last summer um, that Desmond was working on with, with the group was um, to show, show people posts and see how often they could determine the location of the people who were posting mm -hmm. so that they would have a, they would learn what they are revealing in terms of private information. Yeah, it was really interesting. We had 400 people from uh, neighborhoods in Brooklyn, and in their post um, program reflection, they said, I had no idea that my post could be understood from this perspective. I'm now going to change how I interact on uh, social media. And that's not something that we were uh, intending to do uh, initially, but it kind of came out of this research process that Kathy was talking about. Yes? I have a couple question about the, the NLP tools that you developed. So you mentioned that you um, <coughs> use pre-training, um, or you plan to use pre-trained uh, language models, um, and you also use distance supervision. So I'm wondering about um, the transfer of learning that may need to happen from a different domain to the kind of language in, in this post. Um, I, it seems like you had to develop a lot of specific language-specific techniques. Do you think it's possible to utilize uh, our, our domain uh, language uh, tweets or other language for this? So for the part of speech tagger, um, we trained it um, using domain adaptation. So we had labeled tweets from our group, but we also used a much larger set of tweets that were labeled by CMU, also for Twitter. Um, using that alone on our data um, gave fairly low results, but when we combined it with our data, we could increase the accuracy of the first speech tagger. Um, yeah, when we moved to the neural net approach, then we don't have to worry about having those tools. We don't use those tools. Um, so, so then, you know, we can we can train the data that we have. Question. So related to related to that question about learning adaptation. Um, so, could you instead use data from like other more concentrated black communities in other places, like for example, not just Chicago, but Brooklyn, um, or like facing Cali? So would it be possible to use data sets from like, other black neighborhoods um, for annotation? Um, so that is one of the directions that we're going in, is um, to see how well it carries over to, to other neighborhoods. Um, we would again have to label data from other neighborhoods. But I actually, I mean, I've seen um, a talk by a group at UMass Brendan O'Connor, who's done some work um, in this area, and uh, who was developing tools, you know, o not specific for Chicago, but overall. And um, it looked to me like uh, some of that would be actually quite useful in what we're doing. And so one of the things we had, had originally been concerned about is, um, do we have to have a finite understanding of the language across these different contexts and neighborhoods, right? But that, that really was problematized when we had our young people from Brooklyn come and looking at the language from uh, their counterparts in Chicago. And I would say that our young people from Brooklyn were able to understand about 75% of the context in between from our Chicago um, counterparts. It said that there's a lot of overlap in how young people generally, within a particular context, leverage language and, and context. But there is some very specific elements that are hyper-local. Hyper schools, community blocks, uh, other things that are very very specific to a neighborhood. If you're not from that neighborhood, you're just going to mis misinterpret or misunderstand. Yes. That, that was my question, so I had to think of another one. Um, <laughs> <laughs> um, I was curious, considering that, you know, especially when you talk about aggression, particularly in Chicago with the high murder rate and the fact that so many of the illegal guns come from Indianapolis and, and Indiana mm -hmm. <laughs> and other states, even though they have strict gun laws, and you have places like in other parts of the country, like New York, places where they've had the gun control. Is it possible that the students can sort of connect with each other to sort of like help solve these problems? <laughs> and is you laughing? <laughs> um, you know, in in some capacity, or else work as opposed to having the police force be considered like a very antagonistic or militarized kind of relationship more 
they could work together to try to solve some of those issues? That's precisely our hope, and that's really kind of the art of the educational pieces. So not just kind of leveraging how they make sense of posts, but what do we do with this, and how do yeah. we make sure that we can prevent this in the future? And mm -hmm. I think that hopefully with our partnerships in Chicago, uh, we will get some deeper insights as to how that prevention should look. Um, but we have learned a lot from young people in the past. And so in our lab, we've hired um, two waves of young people from Chicago. Um, and they have provided some really important critical um, insights as to how we should conceptualize threats and kind of the um, misinterpretations that happen around how we think about threats. So how do we leverage that in a law enforcement scenario where they're leveraging social media to follow the young people in a particular community. And so we're hoping to kind of figure out how do we move that from this educational space to a training space for law enforcement and other groups as well. Okay. Oh. Um, thank you for your talk. So one thing we've seen with the adolescents more generally is that the number of different social media <coughs> platforms that they're using is very Broad. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm curious if you could speak to why you chose Twitter and if you've thought about looking at other platforms that are designed differently and therefore can, can get We would love to use every platform that is available <laughs> to us and in particular um, platforms like Facebook and Instagram and YouTube because they it's great it's much more easy to um, identify the conversational pattern that happens on those platforms. Twitter's just easier, it's the low hanging fruit. And when we, when we first connected with this, um, with our end user, um, her Twitter handle had been uh, publicized in the newspaper. So we started with her and we um, saw that there is still some traction on Twitter, but we think and what we've learned from our, from our community partners is that most of our young people are on other platforms. And so um, accessing that data is complicated and challenging, but folks have other ways in which we can do that, we would love to hear that. I'm curious about how um, you go through the process of selecting annotators and if you've ever had anyone that's reluctant to participate. Um, specifically, like this idea of like, language is identity, but mm -hmm. also in the context of maybe gang membership, also as protection, perhaps from law enforcement even. Have young people ever come to you and not wanted to participate because of some kind of fear of retaliation or fear that your research might be used mm -hmm. to track down people? The That's a great question. Mm -hmm. So in terms of our community experts, we work with community outreach organizations. These are organizations that do violence prevention work. And we ask them to help us identify young people that would want to be involved in research. The, the good thing about that is that they're in an organization where they're constantly thinking about prevention and intervention. And so they're, they're, they're already there in that step. So we, we're not working with young people who have those particular types of fears, but it is something that we think about a lot for two reasons. Number one, what if they see someone that they know, and how do you um, how do you deal with that? And then um, a, a, a bigger part is there's a lot of trauma that's happening in this space, and so how do you process that? And so in our trainings, we really work to we have a supportive environment where they work through processing these experiences together. And at, at any point that they feel uncomfortable, they are more than willing to drop out of the work or drop out of the study and maintain the payment that we've agreed upon. For our social work annotators, um, everyone's pretty excited to work, <laughs> uh, to do this particular work, but not everyone is apt to do it. Um, and so we've had some challenges with our selection process. A lot of smart people that want to be involved with research but aren't willing to kind of do the the, the tough work to really make sure that you're leaving your biases at the door and that you're trying to understand the context with, um, uh, appropriately, that you're, that you're checking your own biases, that you're aware of what you're bringing to the table, and that's a thing that is not very easy for some of our students. Um, so over the summer we had some challenges, but we've gotten much better with our training and with selecting students that are willing to do that work. Um, sorry, I wanted to build on the previous question. Uh, and I'm trying to understand the consequences of uh, marginalized uh, dialects, uh, mm -hmm. where, where you know, I understand my definition of, of a language is that a language is a dialect with an army and a navy. So I, I, when I use dialect, I do not mean it as, a, as something less than a language. Sure. Um, so on the one hand, uh, a, a marginalized dialect or language uh, allows uh, a, some protection to, to, to the people who, who use it, protection from surveillance. On the other hand, it also excludes its members from 
positive interventions like the ones that you envision. So I'm trying to understand the, the consequences for, for that particular community of uh, using a language that is hard to access. Like, are they receiving less scholarly attention than, than other uh, at-risk communities? Um, are, are your efforts to penetrate that language are ultimately good for, for that community, or are you threatening it? And if it's good, are uh, approaches like yours automatable and generalizable so that more scholarly work with positive impact could happen? Um, yeah, you really outlined a really interesting paper that we should write. <laughs> um, I, don't, I, mean, I don't have an answer to that. I think that on one end, um, you know, they're writing, their engagement is not intended for us. They're not writing for us. They're writing for a very particular audience. We want to honor that. Um, this particular community gets a lot of attention in very <coughs> negative and pathologizing ways. And our hope is that we can unpack um, deeper meaning in the context so that people can understand that there's more to the conversation than just aggressive um, uh, aggression and threat. And so one thing that we kind of glossed over is that aggression is really very small in our data set. So that means that young black and brown kids on the south side of Chicago are not sitting around on Twitter threatening each other all day. But when it does happen, it's important. We want to be able to un unpack those moments and those trigger moments, right? Um, but I think that um, it's, it's a question that we're constantly um, wrestling with. And this is partly why I'm doing this fellowship at Berkman is to really kind of think about the ethics behind this work. And so if, if folks have ideas around how to do this better and more ethically, we are, we're more than uh, open to those conversations. But it's something that we confront oftentimes in our, in our, in our lab meetings together, too. So, um, you know, from the computational side, first, let me say that it's a very, it's, it's a project that draws people, especially undergraduates. So, um, you know, when the woman next to you was asking whether uh, people did not want to become involved on the annotation side, but on the computational side, we have the same question. But it, I think it's, uh, you know, undergraduate students in computer science don't often get a chance to do something that actually can make an, uh, social impact. So for that reason, uh, you know, it's appealing. Um, I, you know, we started off with more of a focus on aggression, partly because the community groups that we were uh, talking to used it for intervention. <coughs> However, you know, so the idea was they would intervene before violence happened. But I, we, in our discussions, we came out that loss was just as important, that perhaps not more so because, you know, we could intervene in different ways. So I think we did, um, we have thought of, and people, you know, people have pointed out the possibility of what happens if, um, you know, we detect something that really ought to be reported to the police, or what if the police request our, our data, you know, what, Ethically, what do, do we do in that circumstance? But then there's the other issue which you ask, which is um, as we develop tools for this language, does it help? Because more pe it makes the language more visible and more people uh, see it and more tools can be developed. And actually, I mean, I think that's happening. I mentioned Brendan O'Connor, who's uh, looking a lot at um, you know, this, this kind of language. So, and I think when it's uh, talked about at conferences, for example, that um, it can make other people interested in working in the same area. So, I think it's a good thing. You just mentioned the <coughs> uh, involvement of undergraduates in, in the research and how it's attractive to them and it's consistent with experiences I've had in in uh, interdisciplinary research, it's very attractive for undergraduates. Have have you experienced any challenges with finding good graduate student projects um, in this space that get them, you know, on the uh, enough recognition in their home community, whether it's computer science or social work? That uh, you know, uh, is there, you know. 
uh, finding something that really would be recognized as a new computer science contribution or something that maybe has enough clinical implications to be recognized to be the kind of thing that a social work graduate student is looking for or has it has that not been a challenge in so on my side I do have um, two graduate students working with me and have over the past years and I think we really needed them in terms of expertise for when we went to a neuromed approach and I think it's tricky. Uh, they are you know doing a semi-supervised approach and I think there are many more things we can explore and I think the technical aspects of doing that are you know would be and are of interest. So I think there are challenging problems for graduate students. If we went on to some of the other ones that we mentioned, you know, the, I know the idea of a triggering event, which I think is really interesting, but it is really hard. So, yeah. Um, but, you know, I, I like the challenge, so I think the graduate students would too. Yeah, I think for social work, we're in a really exciting time. I think I, I would arguably say I'm probably the only social work faculty member doing this type of research. And so that, that gives a lot of attention, but it also makes it challenging to think about, well, how do you place a student in a particular type of placement? Um, but we're realizing that there is a role for this kind of deep, substantive and contextual understanding in tech spaces and what would it mean for a social worker to work at a place like Twitter or Facebook and bring this kind of deep understanding of population health and communities um, to kind of uh, to really, and, and um, also around ethics as well. We have a very strong code of ethics in social work that we can uh, leverage in tech spaces. And so part of the work that I'm doing at Columbia um, Social Work is to reconceptualize the 21st century. And social work is a person that can work in tech spaces, that can work alongside with um, Kathy and her group to be a kind of um, uh, anchor for the social science uh, uh, considerations, basically. Well, I had a question, but I think it was somewhat addressed, which is, uh, do you anticipate uh, law enforcement interest in uh, have you, your techniques, your methods, or your outcomes, or your initial data? And I think you answered it, that you would welcome it, or you wouldn't be opposed to it. Well, I, I don't know that I answered it that way. I said... Well, I, I didn't ask it, so I'm, yeah. I'm bringing a little bit of it. No, I think we said um, our approach is that we're not working with working with community outreach groups and we're not intending that it be used you know to find people um, but we have been asked you know what do you do in a case there are some ethical issues of what do you do for example if your if your work is uh, I want to say subpoena but that's not the right word you know uh, where the data is the, they request the data yeah. what what do we do so um, I think we're just in the beginnings of sort of discussing that and figuring out what we would do. Yeah, and I think that we would probably, once we're there, lean on the expertise of the outreach organizations to make decisions around mm -hmm. how to partner with uh, law enforcement. So some organizations do not work with the police and mm -hmm. some do. Um, and one of the things we've been thinking a lot about is, you know, how do we kind of Think about the variation in threats and aggression, and at what point should there be law enforcement? So a lot of what we're seeing is kind of low to mid-level aggression that happens on social media. But what happens when it's a direct threat? I'm going to kill you. And at what point should that information be handed off to law enforcement? We haven't gotten to that stage yet. We haven't seen a comment of that in which it's that clear. But we're hoping to um, leverage those partnerships for them to make those types of decisions because they're the expert in that space. But if I can ask a question, this is a new question. Um, it's, it's about your ability from the data. I don't know, I didn't understand much of your methodology. I'm sorry, I'm not trained in that area. But uh, I was curious to know whether you were able to break down kinds of sorrow, the kinds of loss, also the kinds of aggression, but in particular, the kinds of losses these kids are experiencing. Is there a way that you can get at that? Absolutely. So in our current conceptualization of loss, 
um, it, there's two forms. One is a loss around um, friends and family members being incarcerated. So the loss of people from the community is one indication of loss. And another form is more around grief, right? So um, uh, loss is a part of grief, and so being able to first identify that someone has been that someone has been uh, um, uh, killed um, in that uh, kind of close and direct um, indication being through the praying hands or RIP or RIH as being a form of expression of loss, but then it becomes a more deeper grieving process where individuals are kind of expressing anger and disbelief associated with that loss as well. You also eventually you focus specifically on aggression and grief. Um, I was wondering if you were looking into ways in which specific comments may not have been intentionally meant to be aggressive, but could be misinterpreted as such, especially because online, especially on Twitter, when you only have 280 characters, <laughs> things can be misinterpreted and that might actually be a catalyst for That's some kind of violence. That's actually why we started to think more about loss, because when we initially started to do this, oftentimes comments um, were um, identified as being aggressive and when you peel it back deeper, look within, look for more of the contextual clues in the post, there are actually indications of loss and trauma. And so absolutely and we're doing that a lot more, um, especially around things like um, rap lyrics and other forms of kind of trauma communication that happens. It's, it's easily misinterpreted because um, a, a part of aggression, um, excuse me, a part of grief is having a moment where you're angry. And that anger can be uh, can manifest in many different ways, uh, depending on your background, your community context, your neighborhood, so forth and so on. But when you're in a kind of a community that's hyper uh, uh, marginalized and pathologized, it can quickly be misinterpreted. So we want to make sure that when we are saying something that's threatening or aggressive, that some young person from that community also agrees that that is a particular form of aggression. And there's sometimes some variation in that understanding from young people from the community as well. So we try to um, represent it as much as possible. But as you can see, this is a really hard problem as well. So, yeah. so have you considered using the actual classifier to identify those mixed cases? Like in a case where the confidence scores are kind of similar, maybe the tweet has expressions of both loss and uh, aggression or something like that. Yeah, we were just kind of thinking about this uh, um, in our last meeting. So we've been starting with the qualitative piece and then letting that inform the uh, uh, the NLP stuff. And now we're we interested to see how the NLP uh, informs the qualitative yeah. practice as well. And doing more kind of um, traditional ethnographic working communities around some of our NLP, NLP findings would be interesting as well. Yeah, we were thinking of using it to pick out a set of um, tweets from the unlabeled data, which then should be Ah. All right, let's thank our speakers.